when the Buddha first talked about the concept of not-self, he focused on the issue of control, because basically that's what our sense of self comes down to, the things we can control in life. The happiness we can create and the things that we use to create happiness, create pleasure, create a sense of well-being for ourselves and sometimes for the people around us. But the important thing is the control. And what the Buddha does, he points out that all the things that we use to create a sense of self are things that really ultimately lie beyond our control. Forms arise, but they have to pass away. The same for feelings, perceptions, thought constructs, thought constructs consciousness. You can't always say, I want my body to be like this, I want my feelings to be like that. Just simply telling them to do things doesn't necessarily make them do it. You can tell the body not to grow old, but it doesn't listen to you. You find that you have a sense of peace in the concentration and say, okay, I want this just to last. I don't want anything else ever to come, but that doesn't happen. So ultimately, these things do lie outside our control. The question is that on a less than ultimate level, there are, we do have some control over them. For a certain period of life, you want to raise your hand, it actually will go up. If you want to feed yourself, you can find food. This gives us the illusion of control, of ultimate control, which is a problem. But also it means that we actually do have some control in life, and so we should learn how to make use of what we've got control over while we have that control. This is why we can practice. And John Swat once gave a Dharma talk on the topic that karma is not, not self. You never see the Buddha saying your karma is not self. Results of karma are not self. Once you've done something, the results lie outside your control. You've set a series of conditions in motion, and now you can't call them back. But while you're making the decision to act, that's something you are responsible for. You do have control there. So it says focus your attention at the point where you do have control and make the most of it. You can choose to cause suffering, you can choose to cause temporary happiness, you can choose to cause lasting happiness. You can choose to find the end of suffering. These are choices we can make. So don't spend your time getting upset about things that you can't control and focus on the things that you can. And the practice is meant to give you a sense of where that dividing line is. It'll shift over time. That's that passage in the canon where King Basanity says that when he was young he felt that he had the strength of two men. But now that he's old, he wants to put his foot in one spot and it goes someplace else. Even his own body gets uncontrollable in that way. Then he has thoughts that wander in and wander out, and all these other problems. And he's a king. Kings have more control than we do, to some extent. But ultimately, they too have to lose their control. And so a good part of the practice is learning to see where that shifting line of control and lack of control lies at any one particular point and focusing on the area that you can control. You can choose right now to focus on the breath. Now, if the mind slips off, you can choose to come back. You always, with every breath, have the opportunity to choose what you're going to do with that breath, what you're going to do with the strength that comes from that breath. So it's wise to have a clear sense of priorities. What do you really want out of life? where you're really going to look for happiness. 
and then dedicate your efforts in that direction. As for the things that lie beyond your control, be willing to let them go, because your holding on to them is illusory anyhow. You're holding on to an idea that has really nothing to do with reality, and that's not helpful at all. It doesn't accomplish anything, and it wastes the energy that you could be applying to what's within your powers. I mean, this is one of the lessons of the sublime abodings, or the sublime attitudes. You wish for happiness. In general, you wish for those who are suffering to be freed from their suffering. As for those who are happy, you hope that they learn how to maintain their happiness. But there are a lot of cases in this world where there are people who are suffering, you can't do a thing about it, totally beyond your control. There are people who are happy and they abuse their happiness. That too is beyond your control. That's where you have to develop equanimity. In other words, let go of the things that you can't control. So you can focus your energy on the areas where you, that you can. So this is how the not-self teaching gets applied through the practice, even when you're not ready for the ultimate level where you totally abandon any thought of self. What you do is you learn to pare down your notion of self to the areas where it's actually useful. And the Buddha does have lots of things to say about a useful sense of self. As he says, the self is its own mainstay. Who else could be your mainstay? When you gain yourself as a mainstay, in other words, you learn to depend on yourself in the areas where you do have some control. You gain a refuge, you gain a mainstay, he says, that's hard to find. Another passage where he says that the self has to I'm thinking entire right now. The self has to learn how to warn itself, teach itself, bring itself to its senses. Because you can't depend on other people to do that for you. Some people may try, but it's really you yourself who has to make up your mind what you're going to do with your life, what's important, what's not. And so in those areas, you have to develop a skillful sense of self and learn how to let go of anything else that would get in the way. You might say that the teaching on that self ultimately begins with the teaching on dana, generosity, giving, because that's where the Buddha would always start. when he's teaching people brand new to the teaching. He wanted to bring them up to the level of Four Noble Truths. He would start them with generosity, something that they had had experience with, knowing that when you give up something, you're going to get something better in return, a better kind of happiness, that the happiness that could come from, say, eating some food is much, is much less satisfying than the happiness that comes from knowing that you gave that food away to somebody who took, made good use of it. You appreciate that quality of mind that arises. You see its importance. You see its value. If you can't see that value, you'd be very hard to teach. It'd be hard to appreciate the Dharma, because the Dharma base is based on this principle that you give up certain things that you've been holding on to. And it may be hard, but when you do it, you realize that you gain something better in return. Maybe a little bit less tangible, but a lot more lasting. And then that teaching works inward, 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 until ultimately you can give up your attachment to your body, you can give up your attachment to your feelings, thought constructs, perceptions, consciousness. John Mahabua once said that once you finally get to the end of the path, you look back and you see it was the same principle all the way down the line. There was a little 
And Budun said, the Dharma is one thing clear through. It's a principle of where, learning where to let things go and finding that there's a happiness that you don't have to create. It comes from the letting go. It's naturally there, learning to appreciate it, learning to make the most of it. But the Buddha does have you let go in stages. It's only when you're totally ready that he says, okay, all sense of self are a really ultimate happiness. All sense of self has to go. And that includes even your karma, even your choices. You bring the mind to a point of equilibrium where you know that any choice you made going out of that point would bring on more stress. That's the point where you totally let go of karma, where you totally let go of any sense of self. But before you get to that point, don't just let go of everything. You don't want to let go of the path yet. You hold on to the path, like that raft going across the river. As long as you're still in the middle of the river, don't let go of the raft. You let it go only when you've reached the other side. Otherwise, if you want to make a show of how totally unattached you are and you get up and you dance around on the raft, you fall off and get swept down the river. So a lot of insight, a lot of discernment lies in knowing exactly what you still can control, what you still need to control for the sake of the path, and holding on to that and letting go of everything else that gets in the way, and particularly letting go of any idea of trying to bring things that are up beyond your control back under your control. This is why discernment requ requires two eyes. As a John Lee once said, you see the things that are not self, and you know ultimately they are not self, but you try to see, well, what kind of self can you create out of them in the meantime that's actually useful? You can create the self that follows the path, the self that knows how to do concentration, the self that can deal with difficult situations. And you use that sense of self until you don't need it anymore. So that's how, as he says, that's how you find self in not self. Or as a John Swat would say, you focus on the karma, because that's the area where a skillful self can be maintained, put to use. And then like any tool, when you're done with it, you can put it down, set it aside. Because you found the freedom where issues of control or lack of control no longer have any meaning. <laughs>